Okay. So, I'm in bed. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a pretty normal thing for me. Not for the videos, though. But I am in bed. Um, it's because I did a guest podcast thing on Saturday. I sat in a chair for way too long, probably with terrible posture. Um, and the end result was that I pulled a muscle in my back probably. Now I've had back problems since my early 20s or mid 20s, I think. I was in um, college the first time that I had to go to the ER for my back. And so I'm used to this sort of, um, it's a different place in my back, but I'm used to being like, oh, back pain, time to sit here and wait this out. It's boring, but um, I just took a shower and the heat really helped. So that's cool. However, I'm going to try to make this a short one because I have, there are two books coming out uh, by the time this posts. It'll be that day. And um, I really wanted them posted by the day. So I look like crap. I don't care. People who know me, I mean, people who know me well have seen me on the floor doing my back stretches day after day after day. So yeah, let's get to talking about some books because that's all I really want to do. I mean, the first one uh, that comes out October 11th is The First to Die at the End by Adam Silvera. It's a prequel um, of They Both Die at the End, a book that is not lying. It is not lying. Adam Silvera told everybody when it came out, not lying. And everybody read that book and went, oh my God. So apparently it became like a TikTok hit lately. I don't do TikTok because um, until recently I haven't been feeling well enough. Like I don't generally feel well enough every day to just be able to open a video app. Like I pick and choose what I can watch. It usually has to have a very stable camera, which, frankly, people don't do when they make videos. So, um, but yeah, it got popular on Book Talk, I think, a couple years after it came out. Um, and now there's a prequel. So this book is primarily for people who forgot the trauma from the first book because I was like, I liked that book. Now, if I had just looked at my shelf... I would have noticed that it wasn't there, which meant that when I got it for Rainbow, I read it and then passed it on. Now, I pass on a lot of books. I don't keep everything. But I think it's because the book was like pretty traumatic to read and not because it wasn't excellent because I absolutely remember it being excellent. So I start reading this book and I'm like, oh yeah, it's horrifying. So I'm like, oh, great. It actually works for a spooky season because this book is also a, it'll take you through your emotional paces. I don't think there was a feeling I didn't have reading this book. <sighs> like at all. It It's a lot. It's emotionally a lot. And I, I love the idea. It's about a, um, and this book in particular is about the first day of a company that knows when you're going to die and they are launching and you get a phone call uh, at midnight that says, you know, today is the day you're going to die. And it's meant to be this like life changing, revolutionary thing that's supposed to, the owner wants it to like give the world, you know, everyone in the world this like chance to wrap up everything they need to do, call everyone that they need to call, get their affairs in order, whatever. But other people are like scared and skeptical. And I really love that this book delves into the chaos of it. And um, the fact that some a game changer like this 
isn't built in a day. Um, the first book, or rather the, the book that comes later in the chronology, uh, Death Cast is just a way of life. But here, a lot of people just don't believe it's going to work when it launches. So that's a huge part of the book, and I, it's really, really cool to see how that plays out. But for the most part, you are following around, you know, someone who's going to die, and that's really difficult. This is not a book for someone who wants light reading. It's not a book for someone who wants a really, really um, super fun time. It's a book for someone who says, I love this book. It gave me trauma. Now read it. We could talk about it. Um, yeah. So that, it took me a bit. I had to take a break. It like, it rose my, it, it raised my blood pressure a lot. <laughs> Um, I also read a cookbook, which also comes out October 11th. It's called, uh, A Twist on Tofu, which I am, uh, of a vegetarian and was vegan for a really long time. And, um, so I always look at the cookbooks and... This one is, actually, I think it is a really good cookbook for people who don't really know what to do with tofu, but also like people who just want to kind of have all in one place that sort of like, I'm about to go to a party and I need to make something. And it's got like a good spread of things that are both like, okay, I want something from this culture, I want something from this culture, I want something from this culture, but also like a couple of like, how do I put some protein into this meal or how do I replace the protein in like this meal so that I can have it um and either boost the protein in it or still have protein in it now that I'm not eating meat so I thought it was good I like the pictures um it's not like you know super like chit chatty but the descriptions are really good and there's a nice chart at the end and uh, descriptions, I think, of like um, certain, uh, like, instead of having like staples, they're like, here's what some of these things are that you might not have heard of. And it's like, some of them are kind of, I, I guess they're basic to me now. And <laughs> so... But like agaves in there, but also some things from like a bunch of different cultures to like just in case you don't know what they are. So I'm like, oh, so this book is for like white people who want to get into tofu. But um, ultimately, it's really for people, I think, who want to delve into like tofu as a protein source I know that there are a lot of people who didn't grow up with tofu who are like it is the worst but it's really not if you cook it properly and you are like first off it soaks up everything so and silken tofu in desserts um give it give them like a really great creaminess and a protein boost and I just I think that like a lot of times people don't like tofu because they're not used to um they just aren't used to it they didn't grow up with it and so they look at it and they're like I just I don't understand and I just it's so different from what I'm used to and ultimately I think that once you like get it into your diet, you're just like, why did I ever think that this was a thing that I was never going to like? Like I grew up in the eighties. And if you look back at eighties books, there are so many references to how horrible tofu is. <laughs> it's not horrible. It's like in a zillion cultures. So if you like, next time you order Chinese, get like a tofu and meat dish and just see how it like adds extra 
to like what you're eating. It's really, really cool. And it, and there's no reason for all the tofu hate. It's ridiculous. It's just so ridiculous and kind of racist. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, it's not from our culture. It must be awful. Like, sorry, there's a million things that we, you know, we have in like an American diet that are blocks and bland. I'm preaching, I know, but I'm not telling you to become vegetarian, am I? It's not a thing I said. Yeah. Um, I also read some other things. I think I have another book that I read that was new, but I've got to go look back at my list to see what it was. But I also read, finally, got my hands on Loveless by Alice Oseman. And... It's a book about um, a college student who, sorry, university student in England who uh, realizes that she is asexual. And I know that Heartstopper gets a lot of shit for being so soft and so blatantly a woman writing boys kind of a thing. But the thing about this softness in these books is that they're not, like, first off, they're across the board. Like, I've, I've read other books by this author, and that softness exists across the board. And there is a, almost like an instructional softness to it. It's like, here's what it's like to be in university, and here's what it's like to navigate problems with your friends and here's how you've resolved them and here's what maybe not what you need to go for but here's like something that you can sort of shoot for and here's how it gets better and I think that people just really gravitate to them because of that I think that they are very soothing to people who are anxious um, I think the characters there are characters who are anxious and I think every single one of the books that I've read and so I think that level of detail and personal interaction is very calming. Um, and I think it just, I think that that's, I think that's a huge draw, you know? I think that's, um, I think that's really cool. You know, I think... It's funny because I remember when I was younger and I used to read a lot of like Harlequins and stuff, there were a couple of authors who I thought were like too soft. And I wonder <laughs> if like this is kind of that, but for like teens and new adults. On the other hand, those weren't really like instructing you to do anything, but marry really young, so... Okay, one more, then I'm going to stop. I don't know where the camera is here, sorry. Um, I read The Spare Man by Mary Robinette Cowell? Cowell? Man. I said I was going to stop saying names if I didn't know how to say them. And it is, um, if you've ever seen The Thin Man or you know Nick and Nora... Nick and Nora Charles. That's what this is, um, but set in space in the future. It's a mystery. It's really cool. It's fun. Um, the main character is very Nora, and I, I saw some like people complaining, like, "Oh my gosh, uh, she's so the main character is so irritating." I'm like, "Do you not remember Nora?" Don't get me wrong, like, it's been a while since I've watched the movies, but I did read the book, like, earlier this year or last year, and, um, she's a spoiled heiress, like, that's who she is. At least here, she's a spoiled heiress who, like, is smart and does stuff, and she does throw her privilege around quite a bit. Again basically like 
the books. This is... I recommend reading The Thin Man before reading The Spare Man, but only for the fun of it. <laughs> like, I had a good time with it. Maybe you will too. Um, it's it's really, like, I don't really read a ton of mysteries, but this one was interesting. It felt very retro um, while still having, like, a whole bunch of cool space things going on. And... Um, the main character has chronic pain, which is nice, um, because, I mean, uh, and, um, one of the, one of the things that I really liked about it was that there are a lot of characters, and so you never feel like it's not a real mystery, that it's just, like, an author who usually writes in a different genre, like, just deciding that, you know, oh, I'm going to write a mystery, and then, like, half-assing it. This is, like, a straight-up mystery with lots and lots of people that are possible suspects and and with a detailed mystery where, if you want to guess it, I don't do that. I don't play that game. I just let the book go where it goes. Um then, you know, you can try to deduce what's going on the whole time. I get, I, it didn't even occur to me to, like, see if the mystery plays fair. I just assumed that it did because of what books it was based on. Like, I can't imagine it not playing fair. I think there are a lot of clues in places. There are a lot of, like, things you can't guess in the way that, like, good mysteries don't reveal everything. So... It was just a fun book, and I was really happy to read it. So that comes out October 11th as well. So I've read a bunch of stuff, finally. Like, I felt like I wasn't reading for a bit, but now I am. Um, but I'm going to save them for another time. I'm going to try to see if I can change position, get some water in me, and I don't know. Like, I want to try to get some work done, but, like, I can only talk. I can't really think. Yeah. Good times. I'll be better soon. It won't be a big deal. Yep. It's not a big deal.